let's begin. Um, I'll make some administrative uh, announcements. My name is Henry Sikulski, uh, and we run a operation. When I say we, uh, Leon over here, Maya out there, and Bianca, who is not here, uh, small outfit, but we. Uh, run the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center. Uh, this, I guess, marks our 24th year? Time flies, all right. I want to thank the uh, subcommittee on trade, nonproliferation, and terrorism, or I think it's the other way around, terrorism, nonproliferation, and trade. There you go. Uh, for making the room available to us. Uh, they've been tremendously supportive of our operations, and I want to thank them right off the, the bat and Chairman Poe. Um, there are some materials uh, that we made available at the front desk. Um, today's book, yeah, um, which is available on the web. Another book, which is also available on the web. Um, if you have comments, criticisms, or additions, Email me, yeah? I may be able to adjust things, yeah? Uh, I'm not so sure about the plutonium book, but we're always interested in comments. There also is a working paper, uh, which is basically a compendium of commissioned research dealing with the Middle East and the future of nuclear power and nuclear weapons proliferation there. Um, finally, there is a a, an application for a course that is taught on the Hill. It's actually a fellowship because once you get done with the course, there's a retreat, and then you're encouraged to come to uh, certain dinner, dinner seminars. Uh, I am very careful about excluding anyone like myself from applying. You need to be in the government full time you need to be diplomatic staff. You need to be executive or legislative branch staff or a full-time guild journalist. If you're not, hand it off to somebody else. Uh, it's pretty competitive now. We get a fair number of applications, uh, but we're always in search of students. Yeah? So. Uh, Enough with the administration. A few opening comments. I think uh, the few people who endeavor to promote uh, civil nuclear restraints uh, are being told uh, pretty sternly uh, these days that they need to be realistic. I think that's the word, realistic. And. Um, we need to understand that there are limits to how much we can ask other countries to forego, that we have to be in the trade to limit the trade or to be influence the trade, and therefore we need to be flexible when it comes to countries' desires to engage in activities that would actually bring them within weeks of getting a bomb, to be blunt enrichment and reprocessing in particular, but other activities as well. And uh, I think you can see this uh, not so quietly in play in the latest uh, run-up to the U.S. agreement with Saudi Arabia, uh, which will be an opening to follow-on negotiations with Jordan and renewals with uh, Turkey, perhaps. I don't know. Our relations with Turkey are such, it's hard to know. Uh, but Egypt, for sure, and Morocco. And then, of course, uh, the East Asian jewel in the crown, South Korea, will come up because we're doing studies on whether recycling plutonium would be a good idea. And that study will be done, I guess, 2021, thereabouts. And then the question will be, well, can we do it now? Yeah. now I think that all suggests how harsh the environment is out there for people who want to try to restrain certain 
let's not even call it sensitive, dangerous nuclear activity. Um, I think what we're going to be doing today is inserting another element in that discussion. And it's a form of realism, too. And it's a form of realism and a manifestation of a body of information that has been conscientiously downplayed for a very, very, very long time. And that is whether or not and the extent to which one can make effective nuclear weapons with power reactor grade plutonium. And as you'll learn, there's been a standard argument basically emanating from as far back as, I guess, 1945, 46, arguably even a little bit earlier, uh, that, well, you just can't. And a lot of that had to do with the realities of the limitations of bomb design at the time. Those realities are different now. And I think people would like to believe we're still back in 1945. What we're going to learn today is we're not, and that that realism may make the realism of being flexible, I use that term, I think that's the way the diplomats like it. They, they, the, the key thing for diplomacy is to come up with terms that sound attractive and are vague. And so that one works. So maybe we shouldn't be quite as flexible uh, if we understand what's in this book. Uh, we have the author here today, uh, Greg Jones. Uh, I've known Greg, I guess, since, I want to say, at least uh, the late 70s now. When we were in grade school together. <laughs> yeah, but we weren't. <laughs> uh, he uh, represents uh, what I would call the, the, the purest form of, of an American expert. That is to say, someone who gets into a subject and gets uh, thoroughly into it and uh, as a result uh, understands it uh, much more than most because he, he doesn't flit around uh, very much. Uh, focused. Yeah? And I think what's uh, interesting about this book uh, that you have before you is that it is accessible to the lay reader. You don't need to know Hebrew, Shebrew, physics, or Greek, um, just English. It's not necessarily a stem winder, but when you get into it, you come out of it knowing a lot more than what you would if you didn't read it, and it will change the way you look at everything else that's been said on this subject. Um, Greg you know, worked for a man who I think probably had more to do with the current structure of nuclear strategy and nonproliferation constructs than any other single human being. That was Albert Wollstetter. And that Albert was attracted not only to hire you but to keep you um, is a badge of honor. Uh, on my right is Ollie Honenen, who uh, has the experience of working as the deputy for safeguards at the International Atomic Energy Agency. And that is, I would say, one of the most serious jobs there is in our field, maybe the most serious. Um, and I've noticed that the people that I know that do this job are always worth talking to. And Ali is especially uh, is this so because he has the advantage of being retired. That means he can resigned, not retired. What's that? I resigned. Oh, you resigned. Retirement. Oh, well, this retirement even retirement is still far away. Oh, I say. Oh, is that right? Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. Well, you've just gone up in my estimation even more. Okay. Well, so this man has some principles apparently. Okay, um, they generally do there in that particular department, and so I think you can take what he has to say uh, seriously. Yeah. You're not looking for your next job, are you? No, I'm in my current job. Okay, Maybe good. You. Okay, well, there you go. Well, another reason to listen to him. Greg, why don't you begin? Okay. Well, yeah, let me uh, hand over the, the baton. Audio, audio 
visual. Yes. All right. There you go. Yes. Two. Why don't you actually just sit where I am? Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Henry. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, first, the disclaimer, which is also in the preface of the book. Um, it's easy enough to search online, and Jim Warner knows because he, he actually paid me way back when. Um, I consult to the Rand Corporation, and uh, I'm explaining to him a little incident that occurred in, in 2001 uh, that got Rand into a lot of trouble when a researcher did some of his own work, and it led to some international heat. So this is not Jim, and it's not Rand. This is my own personal stuff. Uh, <clears throat> As Henry said, there's been persistent myths. These are just two of many examples. Uh, this statement from 1976 pretty clearly states the, uh, the industry view. And not much has changed. Uh, 2018, the only updating, of course, is now we have it's a fake story. So you know it's 2018 and not something earlier. Now, some people will say, well, you know, it really doesn't matter. I mean, maybe you can make weapons with reactor-grade plutonium, maybe not. But nobody's ever done that. I mean, I, everybody's always gone and made weapons-grade plutonium, and that's all anybody's gonna, ever going to do. Well, I, I, Greg, just one thing. Let's not assume people know what the true grade for the battle is. Maybe we need to. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, Weapons, you know, uh, when uranium is irradiated in a reactor, it's converted into plutonium, in particular plutonium-239. As the plutonium sits in the reactor, some of it gets converted into higher isotopes, especially 240. Uh, when you do make it for weapons, you generally try to reduce the irradiation so the 240 content's low. In a power reactor, you're trying to get as much energy out as possible. So you tend to leave it in longer, and there tend to be higher isotopes. Um, so while this was true in the past, and in fact, as I say in the book, in some sense, countries didn't have any choice but to make weapons-grade plutonium because they couldn't make reactor-grade plutonium back in the 50s. Uh, but today, you know, that path is kind of rough. Uh, Syria found that out in 2007. Their plutonium production reactor was bombed. Uh, repeated Iranian efforts starting in 1991 to get a plutonium production reactor were, have been thwarted over the years. Um, in contrast, if you've got the money, there are a lot of reactor vendors that will build you a power reactor. Uh, even Iran, you know, with, with Bushir. Turns out a quarter metric ton of plutonium every year, uh, barely mentioned in the Iran nuclear deal, which may or may not exist anymore. India, in fact, could well be using reactor-grade plutonium in its weapons right now. Certainly in the past, both Sweden and Pakistan considered using reactor-grade plutonium for their weapons, though for other reasons not related to the kind of the properties of the plutonium, they wound up not doing so. And this is still a continuing issue. There's still a push to separate the plutonium from spent fuel, recycle the spent fuel. The uh, most obvious example is Japan, which has an almost 10 metric ton stockpile of separated plutonium. Question is why? Why is there such an interest to plutonium recycle? Well, this is, the dream has been the plutonium breeder reactor. Now, it turns out the way the physics works out, if you use a plutonium-fueled reactor, um, you can extract substantially more energy from the uranium than the sort of reactors we use today, and perhaps by as much as a factor of 100. This has always had great appeal, and this has always been the dream. Uh, 
Now, it turns out burrito reactors aren't very easy to develop. They're at least uh, 40 years behind schedule. And even the Japanese are saying, well, maybe beyond 2050, we'll be able to, to get such a thing. Now, one argument that it comes up with a lot and still occurs is, well, if nuclear power is going to be sustainable, we need to have burrito reactors. Now, in fact, uranium resources have been no constraint on nuclear power development. Nobody's ever said, well, gee, I'd like to buy a reactor, but I'm afraid there won't be the uranium for it. In fact, um, though there have been ups and downs, the, the, the real price in uranium hasn't changed in 50 years. And nuclear power itself these days is, is facing a rather uncertain future with competition from um, renewables and natural gas. Now, to get just a little bit into the physics, I don't want to delve too deeply, what's, what's the difference between the weapons grade and reactor grade? Well, these higher isotopes of plutonium that are in the reactor grade have a significantly higher spontaneous fission rate. This causes more neutrons. The neutrons could cause predetonation and lower the yield. In fact, that was the basis from the 1940s of, of claiming that the reactor grade plutonium couldn't be used for weapons. A more recent argument is that with current LWRs, um, the plutonium all is also rather hot, hotter than weapons grade, and the heat could cause problems with the high explosives in the weapon, and you couldn't use it. Now, one of the problems with this argument is that of the 270 metric tons of plutonium that's already been separated worldwide, um, most of it isn't anywhere near this hot. So this is always some sort of <coughs> hypothetical future plutonium. And even then, as I'll indicate, you'll be able to use the, this plutonium in weapons if you wanted to. Uh, the Japanese bring up the reactor grade plutonium has a guy, higher gamma radiation output. Again, this is no real problem for any country that doesn't follow U.S. radiation standards. Uh, and also, as I as I'll indicate, it's pretty easy to shield against. There's been ongoing debate for way back when. Some work I was involved with in 1976 um, uh, at a place called Pan Heuristics uh, prodded the U.S. government into admitting for the first time publicly that reactor grade plutonium, in fact, could be used to produce nuclear weapons. And in 1977, it went further and revealed that in 1962, it actually conducted a nuclear test using reactor grade plutonium. However, the briefing was never formally published, and the US never revealed what the plutonium-240 content of the 1962 test was. This has allowed the nuclear industry to continue to dispute these facts. They've claimed falsely that the test in 62 was not reactor grade plutonium and have often resorted to these more ad hominem sort of arguments uh, against those who might, people like myself. And classification has tended to make it difficult for the US experts who really know to weigh in on this subject. Now, as I, again, it's in the book, uh, Using reactor grade plutonium in, for weapons is actually pretty easy. Uh, if you reduce the mass of the plutonium, you can reduce its uh, predetonation probability. In fact, you can make it just the same as that of a weapon manufactured with weapons grade plutonium. With the reduced plutonium mass, it's not hard to, to handle the heat. Um, you can also put a thin coating like a fifth of an inch, half a centimeter, uh, on the core, which would act, could act as part of the tamper. Uh, this, the radiation is uh, weak and easily shielded, so this thin uranium coating would reduce the gamma radiation to less, significantly less than that of the weapon grade plutonium. Now, by reducing the mass, you reduce the yield of what you get but you'd get a lethal area at least 40% and maybe more like two-thirds that of a weapons-grade plutonium weapon, which is still quite sizable. And in fact, as I 
discuss in chapter 8 in the book. Um, the, the 1962 test did, in fact, use reactor grade, what's considered reactor grade today, at this high plutonium-240 content. Also, thanks to North Korea, we now no longer think of boosting technology as something exotic and far away for early nuclear powers. There's some talk that uh, North Korea tested a boosted weapon back in 2016. Um, and if that's the case, then boosting technology may be becoming much more widespread. And for those sorts of weapons, it doesn't matter what, whether you use weapons grade or reactor grade plutonium. Now, part of the problem with the discussion is that people still assume that any country's first nuclear weapon has to be Fat Man. Fat Man was the weapon we tested in 1945 in New Mexico and dropped on Nagasaki um, a few weeks later. It was a large weapon, five feet in diameter, thick amounts of uh, high explosive. A more advanced but still quite primitive weapon as, as significantly less sensitive to the properties of reactor grade plutonium, uses much thinner amounts of HEU, assembles faster, so the, these stray neutrons have less time to cause problem. And thanks to Prime Minister Netanyahu, we have this latest example of what Iran was thinking of doing. That's a Shahab 3, so with that knowledge, you can figure out that the weapon there is only about two feet in diameter. And again, this was what Iran was planning to build as its first weapon in 2003. Now, why, do, why does all this matter? As I said, Japan already has a 10 metric ton stockpile of this. They're planning to open a plant that would add eight metric tons per year to this stockpile. Both China and South Korea are angling to emulate Japan. The issue is coming up uh, nuclear cooperation agreements with Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, Henry mentioned. Even the Iran nuclear deal was focused solely on weapons grade plutonium. It assumed that that was the only worry. It was okay for Iraq or Bushir to produce reactor grade plutonium and permitted separated plutonium after 2030. So what's the bottom line? Basically, we need to be just concerned about reactor grade plutonium as weapons grade. Separated plutonium can be converted into nuclear weapons cores in just days or weeks. It's difficult for the U.S. to react in such a short time. And so the policy implication is the U.S. needs to prevent and eliminate separated plutonium stocks in any non-nuclear weapons state. Thank you. Hand off here. Mike. Of course, the, the next question that occurs is, yes, but we can safeguard it. And um, I suppose the, the question that occurs is, uh, how well? And there, there are, there's one metric, which is the timeliness of the question or warning. Uh, which is the essence of what the safeguards department of the IEA has to struggle with. And then there is the question also of what Holly Honanovic now sees to us, and that is he, he advises folks that want to negotiate a cutoff in the production of different material. Well, what should such a treaty cover? Should it include reactor grade plutonium or not? So thank you, Henry, and thanks for inviting me, and nice to see you all here. And I would talk a little bit about, as uh, Henry said, about the implications of this to the IAEA work. But as he mentioned, this has also implications to arms control and even for the disarmament, which might take a little bit surprise some of you. And let's start from the IAEA. IAEA safeguard system is based on deterrence by early detection if someone wants to divert nuclear material like plutonium for undeclared or clandestine purposes or nuclear weapons. And there are basically two major parameters how it works. One is the quantity you want to 
detect when it's diverted and what are the physical characteristics of that content like plutonium reactor grade plutonium uh, or Webos grade plutonium or enriched uranium high enriched uranium and to which level you want to go and equally important number is then the detection time how well in advance you will see that this amount will disappear from the inventory, which is the detection time. Uh, if we look today's world, and let's start from the spent fuel and plutonium in spent fuel and separated plutonium. 450 reactors are currently operational worldwide. Their current inventory of plutonium is spe in spent fuel is 400 tons. So quite a few nuclear weapons you can make. And those inventories are going to increase because there's practically no plutonium re re recycling apart from Russia and France today. All the others are practically accumulating this uh, plutonium. And every year there is, as uh, Greg mentioned, typical light water reactor, perhaps a quarter of ton plutonium, will, metric ton will come out and sits there in the spent fuel. Verification of that is fairly easy. So the agency has good systems, measurement systems, and you have time. Because even if someone captures that plutonium, it will take time to separate it and turn it to material which is suitable for weapons purposes. And the IEA uses normally uh, three months detection time for that process. So every three months you make damn sure that not one significant quantity of spent fuel is missing from the stocks. But then it gets much, much more problematic with the plutonium, and particularly now we also with these findings of uh, Greg. Uh, there are 270 tons plutonium out there, fresh, unirradiated plutonium, which can be any time converted to nuclear weapons purposes. Conversion doesn't take very long time. If you have prepared everything, it's a matter of a week or two when you take the plutonium nitrate or plutonium powder and turn it to the plutonium metal, machine it to the proper shape, and you have material for your nuclear pit. Out of these 270 tons, uh, but close to 90 tons is actually under IAEA control. 10 tons is in, uh, in Japan, as uh, he mentioned, and then there's actually quite big quantities in the UK and elsewhere. And I think that here is then the, perhaps the first problem, because th two, three months, weeks is not a very long time in an international community. And you are just looking plutonium, you are not uh, looking anything else. If you only look that Plutonium is uh, accountancy and verification is your only tool to make sure that someone doesn't dash to nuclear weapon. I think you will lose the game with the longer term. Because nuclear energy, uh, weapon is actually, it's a, like a pole with ten, pole in a tent with two poles in a tent. One is the nuclear material and plutonium, and one is the nuclear device and delivery vehicle. So what you do, you uh, develop your delivery systems, you deliver, develop your nuclear weapon design, but you don't touch plutonium. And then when you are ready, you dash with the uh, integration and make it into weapon. And there is no international system today which controls missiles which are developed for uh, nuclear weapons. Certainly this is a proscribed activity in. Uh, in a non-proliferation treaty for the countries which are non-nuclear weapon states. But there's no limitation for any other country, like North Korea. In that sense, there are some other limitations somewhere else. So we have a challenge here. And I think that the, one of the challenges is that the IAEA verification system under the NPT needs to be modified. There's a big dispute in the international community. Should the IAEA start to follow nuclear weaponization activities because it may contribute at the same time to proliferation, which actually it should be fighting against. But I don't think that we can leave long time 
with the expanding plutonium, particularly fresh plutonium stocks, unless we start to look deeper to the weaponization activities. And a good example was two weeks ago when you saw the cachet of uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, which was actually most of this was not only this picture which Henry showed, but you saw there are other stuff which were to do with the hemispheres and some hydrodynamic tests to, to see how the implosion proceeds, etc. So this is an area where the international community has now to think how we combat against uh, proliferation there so that we find in advance those things which take place. And for, for example, to the IAEA, and if they control plutonium, they have also to look what is the inspected party doing with the plutonium, not just accounting. What's the purpose? Is this a plausible use? How these facilities have been designed? Are there any indicators that they are not, for example, producing mixed oxide fuel for uh, fast breeders, but uh, they are working with plutonium metal, which is entirely different ball game, and the only real explanation is a weaponization. So this is something what we, what we need to look now in the light of these findings. Then there is also another weakness of the NPT, which has been there a long time, but uh, needs to be addressed. And this is the withdrawal from the NPT. So you, you accumulate your plutonium stock, let the IAEA to measure. And then when you are ready, you withdraw from the MPT by uh, uh, claiming that your national security is compromised. This is a uh, provision in the NPT. One country has done it, North Korea. We see the result. And uh, there has to be some more radical measures when this takes place in order to close the patient path for the nuclear weapons that you develop everything and then you just decide to quit. And you have seen also in f last few months that some of the Iranian uh, high level officers like uh, Admiral Shamkhani has presented ideas that, you know, if this JCPOA doesn't go properly, we will withdraw from the NPT. And there is not very much we can do at this stage if they have already developed all the capabilities. And then last and not the least, and this is important point for the future and for the disarmament. And this is a fissile material cutoff treaty. A week from now, we convene again. I'm part of the group which makes recommendations for the elements of the, such a treaty. And one of the disputes we, we have there is what is fissile material? What will be the definition for fissile material subject to this treaty? And here, the international community is pretty much split. Some of the nuclear weapon states, like uh, Russia, advocates that actually the treaty, only treaty obligated material should be weapons grade plutonium, plutonium which has more than 95% 239 isotope, is actually even more pure than what Craig presented here. At the same time, if there is a country who wants to develop nuclear weapons, from the reactor grade material. I think that in the best position to do that is a nuclear weapon state. So at the same time, nuclear weapon states are worried that the non-nuclear weapon state may decide to go and build a nuclear weapon from reactor grade m material, but they think that they would never go. Sure, their stocks for weapon grade plutonium are today high, but with the time, it may be different. And then we have also the smaller nuclear states with the nuclear weapons, whose stocks are much less. So this is also, I think, an important contribution of this book to this debate. And I will take your book there and probably get some less pleasant feedback. So thank you. That's a real endorsement. Yeah. Now, just two comments. Lest you think the folks in the Pentagon where I work weren't interested vigilance about nuclear weapons design. There were discussions, I don't know when they have bothered to rejoin the issue, but quite a while ago when we were engaged in fighting Iraq, it was an issue. And 
some of the objections to encouraging the IEA to get into this were, as you mentioned, uh, I think Freda Clay put it best, it's now a college for countries to learn how to defeat inspections because they go and they learn how to do inspections. So, you know, just like any good policeman can become a great criminal, you have a problem. And then he said, it may become a graduate school for bomb design. So that little you know, snide comment. I think that said, I sympathize with your point of view. This is something the agency clearly should be able to have certain capabilities in, to do. However, there was, a, there was another comment which I think will be mm, more difficult to um, downplay. And, and that is something which uh, is uh, true as well in a much more fundamental way. And that is, if you're a modern country and you're working on uh, things like anti-tank explosives and the such, you're doing an awful lot of work on shape charges. And these are the things that are the explosives and the things that are complicated in an implosion design. Uh, they're not everything, but they're a big part of the complication of doing bomb design. And there are other things that go on uh, having to do with uh, hydrodynamic uh, problems and other aspects of military uh, development that well, roughly can be useful also for hydrodynamic problem solving associated with weapons design. What I'm trying to get at is we should do all the things you mentioned, but we should not overrate how much of a wall that might be to the problem set. Finally, one other comment. One of the things that Greg's book sensitizes you to, well, actually two comments, is first of all, does anybody know what the yield of that diagrammed uh, nuclear warhead uh, circa 19, uh, 2003 for Iran was supposed to be? Anybody know? Very important number. Maybe, maybe, the, yes. Yeah. Does anybody know? Because that number may be the only number you want to remember when you walk out of here. It was 10, 10 kilotons. Now, why is that an interesting number? Well, if you read Greg's book, just the introduction, that's the gentleman sees chapter. You only, if you only read one chapter, read that, and you, you can get away with a little bit of murder. You won't have to read the rest of the book necessarily, but at least you read should. that. You should, but at least read that one. In there, there is a discussion that the weapon that you can design using uh, 1950s technology is approximately 12 kilotons. And it's roughly the diameter that would fit in that missile. Now, why would people settle for 70% of the lethal area of Hiroshima? Surely they'd want more. Well, the rejoinder is, just as bomb design has changed since 1945, the delivery system accuracies have vastly improved. India, China, North Korea, South Korea, Iran, all have what we thought in 1987 was the most advanced missile guidance technology in the world. You can go down to the Air and Space Museum a few blocks from here and look at it. It's a Pershing II. It's called Maneuverable Reentry Vehicle. Well, they have it. That gives them accuracies of 500 yards or less. Now, if you know something about probability of kill calculations and accuracy, there isn't a target on the point of the Earth that's on the surface that cannot be destroyed with that kind of accuracy and that kind of yield. And if somebody thinks you can't make a political statement destroying a city center with 12 kilotons, I got a bridge I can sell you. That's enough. This is a different world. This is a different military calculation 
than anyone is thinking about. Welcome to your future. That problem set is not just from reactor grade, but things that could be made from reactors, including, if you empty the reactor early, weapons grade. So the problem, again, has to do with the spread of the plutonium production capacity. Now you'll say, well, but where will I get the reprocessing know-how? And the rejoinder is, that is a chemical process, and much has been released publicly over the years to show that roughly you need a room hmm, th maybe three times the size of this one, and that's it. And it will fit, and it won't throw off a signal to you're ready to go. You can build it in a matter of maybe as little as six months, and you run it for a week for your first bomb's worth and one weapon a day afterwards. That is a problem. In fact, we've already had our first brush with that in, 19, in 2012 when they unloaded Bushir. There were not inspectors in the building. We freaked out and flew drones over it, about 12 or 13 of them, to make sure nothing left the building because there was about 10 to 20 bombs worth of weapons grade plutonium in the spent fuel. So this is the new future. We're no longer talking about hypotheticals here. All right, let's open it up. Yes, if, let's look, you know, for the IAEA perspective. There are two aspects to this. The first aspect is that, you know, uh, are you able to find a clandestine processing facility? Or is this happening in the declared place or location or declared site? For the latter one, it's much more easier because IAEA has different tools. It's present there more often, particularly if there is an uh, uh, institution like additional protocol you can visit in short notice any building at that site and you can see what they are doing. Difficulty will be the finding of the clandestine site. You saw recently how, how the it, difficult it was to find this Alkipar reactor in Syria which was about one year uh, from the actual f uh, putting the fuel in. And uh, Syria was very well, I think, monitored country. Such kind of installation is also fairly large. But if you are building an Avlis facility or uh, 
or some other laser establishment, or even a, a gas centrifuge plant. Their footprints are not very high. And there are no real signatures which come out, like in a reactor you might have a stack, you have a fairly large cooling system somewhere, so this may give some hints. But, uh, you know, if you have a gas centrifuge plant, you take as an example of this Iranian IR2, it's out there. So if you have 6,000 such centrifuges, you will produce high-end uranium for maybe three nuclear weapons every year. How big it will be? I think, I think it's a roughly the size of Safeways in, in uh, Georgetown. Not more. And you can have everything there. And then you plant it to some industrial complex. There is no detector which will help. So you have to find it out through the infrastructure, same way as it was found in Bordeaux in uh, Iran, that they saw the people communicating and buying equipment, and then they try to figure out what is the possible place where they go, and then probably through human intelligence they got lucky. So this is a tremendous uh, challenge to the international community, particularly for those states which are parking for their first nuclear weapon or first weapons to find it in time and to be able to do something still with that. And then weaponization itself is, a, is another other thing. Uh, and sometimes the indications come from there. And if you look how we peeled, for example, uh, Iran, so yes, there was a heavy water reactor, it's a very difficult to find a, a reasonable, uh, justified use for that. But then you still didn't have any, any proof at that point of time on weapons. But then you started to find that they were interested on polonium-210, which is not a nuclear material. Uh, and we found that they were uh, trying to produce it. So uh, it's uh, difficult to explain to the people where you use put polonium-210 today. Maybe 1950s, 1940s, there were some uses. So it's a different ball game, and one has to look those various indicators, even though polonium is a little bit old fashioned way to make an initiator. If you work with the neutron sources, tritium or deuterium, a, you will have you know, tens of explanations, you know, which will fit to the story that this is a peaceful use, nothing to do with the nuclear weapons. So it's a, it's a difficult, but it only comes with the, this kind of multi-source information analysis and looking at the infrastructure, procurement, projects, publications, guys, use of materials, and acquisition of other technologies. And most of it, IAEA cannot do alone. Yeah. So, Greg, you talked about how you would compensate for the pre-detonation uh, mm -hmm. Well, that's I do discuss it in the book, um, and indeed, even with pretty high plutonium-240 content. Maybe we should repeat the question because we have a low speaker. Hello? <laughs> what was the question? The questions raised. Um, I was talking about weapons where you can make the pre-detonation probability the same. Ed's asking, well, what about weapons that do pre-detonate? It's not like they yield zero or anything. In the worst case, you have something called the fizzle yield, which is the, the worst, where, which for the Nagasaki weapon was 700 tons, which doesn't sound like that much. But the, again, the lethal area isn't scaling linearly. So you're still talking about 20, 30 percent of the, of the um, lethal area. And I was responding that, indeed, I discuss it in the book. Um, and you, you almost always get higher than the fizzle yield. The fizzle yield is sort of the absolute lowest. And you can always get usually a, a few, few kilotons. In fact, some work that Carson Mark did and then the work Henry commissioned way back in 2004 um, 
with an, Harmon Hubbard, another weapon designer, created a methodology that I then use to give predetonation probabilities and different yields that you would get uh, for, for different uh, uh, neutron backgrounds. So it's worth reading. Well, but beyond worth reading, apparently a fizzle yield could ruin your afternoon. Well, <laughs> it would. Yeah. I mean, because, you know, it's something that's in a kiloton range. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a thousand times more than a ton of high explosive. Yeah. Well, you say that, but the terms of the Iran nuclear deal uh, didn't reflect it. And certainly there were people, people in, in DOE who knew the truth, but apparently however that agreement got put together, and I certainly don't know, there were people who thought, well, it's only weapons grade. Uh, and, reactor grade. You know, it's only weapons grade that we need oh, to worry about. Well, the people who formulated it did, did. Did, didn't seem to know. <laughs> well, that's a shame. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, think that Dr. Moynihan was worried about the world. But, but, no, 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 seriously. I'm really, I'm really dead serious about what do we do okay. in the reality space where there are tons and tons of spent fuel, as we know, which may be easy to account, right? I mean, that, that could be the best non-proliferation strategy. Spend fuel bundles that you know have really strong IDs, and you know exactly I'm thinking of where they are, and they're certainly easier to trace than once you start reprocessing and doing other nefarious things. And, and never mind the good. So I'm really serious about it. That's the given. What do we do? Uh, well, well, as I said, the policy implication there's having it still in the spent fuel is a significant barrier against bad yeah. use. So the key thing is to keep it there. And there are still people who, as I said, for various reasons, are still promoting plutonium recycle. Still, I mean, as I say, Japan's going ahead. And, and it's not like the US has said, hey, this is a bad idea. Uh, Well, certainly some sort of disposal. I mean, as you know, there, there were two variants. One was to burn it as mox, another was something, I forget the, the jargon. Can and can. Can and can, yes. Uh, well, I, they, the, the names keep changing, but essentially one was to yeah, fiddle with it, maybe even separate it, play with it, and then irradiate it, and the other was to put it with other garbage and so, 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 but again, I'm less concerned about what goes on in the United States than I am in non-nuclear weapon states. Uh, uh, certainly, because uh, those are ones that can proliferate. Now, certainly, you know, the U.S. also wants to deal with this. But I mean, you know, my focus is more on on countries that could produce n new nuclear weapons, as it were, or make new nuclear weapon states. 
to answer your question just a little bit further, look, we, we had a uh, release event two days ago, and this came up. Uh, someone said, well, you know, what are, the, are there any policy prescriptions out of this? Uh, you know, one comment that was made is it might be obvious to people who come to events like this and study up, but you've self-selected yourself into a strange set of people to begin with. Most <laughs> don't. Uh, and it might be useful to start making distinctions between those materials and activities that are so close to being a bomb or to becoming a bomb that you do not really get a reliable timely detection or timely warning period. Now, certainly everyone would, in principle, understand that if it was a nuclear weapon that you were inspecting, you do not have timely detection or warning because, hey, you've got the thing that you're trying to prevent extant in front of you. Now, okay, so generally you're also able to get the average citizen uh, untutored to understand if you take one screw out of that that disables it, but you could put the screw back in 10 seconds, that won't exactly be qualified as something that gives you timely detection or warning. If you started to make a distinction between that which you can monitor or inspect versus that which you can get reliable, early enough warning or detection of a diversion going to a bomb, and you made the distinction that, well, some things can be monitored or inspected, but only other things can be actually safeguarded out of that larger group. That might be useful. And you would presumably not be so excited about sharing the peaceful benefits of unsafeguardable nuclear activities or materials. It might help. Roughly, that's what happened to peaceful nuclear explosives. They actually were not requested and not uh, set off after people discovered that actually they're basically bombs and there's no way to monitor or to prevent someone from doing a peaceful nuclear explosive in a way that would keep them from learning everything they needed to to make a bomb. So now <laughs> Article 5 of the NPT, which talks about sharing the possible benefits of nuclear explosives has been eclipsed and reinterpreted to be dead letter. Well, what well, isn't diffuse, yeah, okay, well, what isn't diffuse, what isn't diffuse, and we need to get yeah. some other questions here, but what isn't diffuse, and the reason, maybe like a fanatic, there are groups like my own that say, heads up, is we're not quite there yet. The number of countries that make plutonium that is separated, or that make highly enriched uranium, or even low enriched uranium, is not that many yet. Best to be turning your headlights on when you're driving through this neighborhood. It's dark out there. <coughs> you might hit something. That's why we're here today. <laughs> okay, Mark. So in a boosted weapon, the fusion boost is set off by the fission explosion. Yeah. So why wouldn't the boost be affected by pre-detonation? Because it only needs something like 100 tons worth of yield to set it off. And once you set it off, then the yield tends to be driven by the neutrons produced in the fusion reaction. Um, so so the, every, every U.S. nuclear weapon now has boosted primaries as a result. It's made, for the U.S., it's a safety issue because basically you can set the weapon up so that you aren't trying to get 10 kilotons, you're only trying to get 100 tons. And, but then you buy that back with the boosting. 
basically, mm -hmm. you, you race ahead by flooding the reaction with neutrons before it can blow apart. Mm -hmm. So you get ahead of the pre-detonation by having neutron fissioning generation to occur Are even you quicker. Even pre-detonation there'd be enough yield to set up. Well, in fact, reaction. booster weapons are pre-detonated. It's not, it's, it's deuterium and tritium. And, and so weapons are, are pre-detonated. They're flooded with neutrons as they detonate. So that's why the, it doesn't matter whether it's reactor grade or weapons grade. Well, that part is only after you have your, your fuse boosted from the after the fission detonation. You have, the, you have a neutron generator that, set, that, that goes off at the same time that the uh, high explosive goes off. Mm -hmm. So the weapon's but, flooded. But the flooding of neutrons is not until the, the uh, solution. No, the, 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 way, the weapon's flo flooded with neutrons from the initiator. I mean, not the same level of flooding. But enough to pre-detonate it. If they get that same neutron generator, whether they're boosted or not. Yeah. Um, well, okay. now, now, well, then you time the then you time the initiator differently if it's not boosted. And a non-boosted weapon. Too much of a delay, and it becomes too diluted. One, one thing here, I think the weapons design uh, agency should be set up for all foreign countries and they should work with you, but in the hallway. Well, it's sort of important because a key aspect yeah. of the book is that um, boosted weapons mean make uh, grave plutonium irrelevant, so that's a fairly important question. Well, they do. Well, they do. Okay, okay. so that was my question. Is okay. That How? What's in the book? Where, well, <laughs> a more a more modern a more a more modern design of weapons called boosted, and in that sort of weapon, you you make them hollow, and right before you set it off, you put a gas mixture of deuterium and tritium in it, and as you detonate the weapon. So when you, in an ordinary fission weapon, you detonate the weapon and it gets compressed and you're trying to wait till it gets to the optimum compressed and then you release neutrons and it goes boom. But in a boosted weapon, I release the neutrons as soon as I detonate the weapon. So, so just as the weapon goes critical, it's already blowing up. And, and, and so the... By the way, oh, this is not, no, as soon as yeah. soon as the weapon becomes critical, the weapon's subcritical when it's sitting there. I detonate it, the weapon becomes critical. I've already released neutrons into it, so fission chain reaction, boom. You have a nuclear explosion. The yield's only 100 tons, but 100 tons is enough to set off the, the DT reaction in the center of the thing. That produces not much yield, but it produces a large number of neutrons. Those large number of neutrons cause a large number of fissions, and I go back from 100 tons to 10 kilotons. Or, it no, it was pre it, it was pre I think you have a, a, a linguistic bridge you got to make between the word pre-detonation and fizzle failure. Okay. You, can pre you can pre-detonate and still get to the 10 so kiloton yard line. If the yield that you expect is from weapons right, right, grade right. is lower right. because it's reactor grade, then it might not be enough to trigger so, yeah, yeah, so is that right? No. The, the yield's always going to, I can always get 100 tons. I mean, as, as you mentioned, I mean, the fizzle yield of even Nagasaki, which was a pretty primitive weapon, was 700 tons. So I can get, I can get 100 tons. Well, but I, I, before the fusion reaction takes place, I have a nuclear detonation, and I get a 100-ton yield, and that 100-ton yield then sets off the fusion reaction, which releases a lot of neutrons and boosts the yield back up to 10 kT. Let's, let's okay. off-ramp this, please. All right. Because all you need to know is boosting, schmoosting, or not. Without it, you can get 
the 10 to 12 kiloton design on top of that Iranian missile. So this is icing on the argumentative cake. Okay. All right. So, so we had. Yeah, yes. Let's. How high what was? No, because of the isotopes of plutonium. Uh, so, you, so you, I start out getting plutonium-239, but as it sits there in the reactor, some of it fissions, but some of it becomes plutonium-240, and then plutonium-241, and then plutonium-242, and so then the plutonium is a mixture of that. And also, if I'm using enriched uranium, I get plutonium-238. I mean, again, this is discussed in Chapter 3, I think. Um, and because of this mixture, then the plutonium has different properties because the different isotopes have different properties. Well, I thought you were talking about the acid. Um, mm -hmm. But a, a, related, um, a related question, and I know you don't go into this in the book, about um, the use of lasers and are, or do you go into that? No, I don't no. say a word about lasers. Because, because fortunately, uh, that, that's not an issue. I mean, people were kicking that around, especially in the 90s in the U.S., that one, they were going to try to isotopically separate plutonium isotope. But nobody's done that. As far as I know, no one's anywhere close to doing that. That's, that's one of the things we don't have to worry about at, at the moment. I put it. The good news is the news is bad enough. You don't need that. You're in trouble already. <laughs> okay. Okay, so back to the fact that we have all this reactor grade plutonium laying around. And we maybe we can, maybe we cannot detect nefarious uses, whatever. So what options do we have? Do we have a volunteer or an IAEA based like human intelligence force that like will volunteer to monitor in the facilities they work? Or do we secondly to prevent these non nuclear countries Everybody wants a reactor. Everybody wants nuclear power. They want to play with the big boys. Do we reinvigorate the U.S. nuclear industry so that we're the ones providing these reactors and the fuel and taking it back? Because as the former head of the American Nuclear Society said when we briefed DOD many years ago, if we don't play, we have no say. Yeah. So if By the way, that, that, this, that rhymes. And we're not there. Yeah, okay. How do we monitor? Okay. I think we got the question. Why don't we let these two people answer? Well, the U.S. has a lot of influence whether we play or not. I mean, we didn't provide reactors to North Korea. Um, well, among other problems, there's, there is no more U.S. nuclear industry. So, so, well, and I grew up in Pittsburgh, and they, to think what Westinghouse is now is sort of a, a strange thing. But... Uh, Nevertheless, it's not clear what nuclear future there is. I, I'm far more concerned about keeping the plutonium in the spent fuel of the countries that got the reactors already, rather than trying to provide even more reactors to more countries. But that's going to happen no matter what. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You make Whether it. Whether we do anything. Yeah, okay, let's stop. Uh -huh. Wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. You make it sound like. This is like a television. It's on or it's off, or it's like a pregnancy. You're either pregnant or you're not. It matters a lot whether it's a lot of reactors in places like the Middle East or not. It matters when. It matters what the conditions are on that fuel. And I think the idea that, oh, well, what we'll do is, you know, do with nuclear energy what we did with John Glenn. We'll shoot him back up in space a second time and we'll recreate this industry, that cannot be the only option because that does suggest, you know, demoralization is the only course. You know, we were told recently, right up here, not in a room much below one floor here, that we didn't have any choice. We had to be in the trade to control it. In the case of Saudi Arabia and, dare I say it, South Korea that unless we were in the trade and dominant and being the only supplier, we couldn't encourage South Korea 
or Saudi Arabia to think about what the terms might be for doing nuclear energy activity. Now, there was somebody in the room, thankfully, and had election certificates that said, you've got to be kidding. We're selling these people hundreds of billions of dollars of arms. In one case, we have 28,000 troops. Are you telling me that America isn't even that great that it can't talk about this with them? Well, we could be. Well, I think the short answer, of course, was thank God for the guy who got election certificates. He had common sense. The answer is yes. Not only that, but you know, one of the other interesting things, which was raised by someone at another gathering recently, do you know how many countries enrich uranium that sell it commercially? Not many. Do you know who are the most dominant? Well, they're Europeans. Well, actually, Urenko. Russia. Say again? Russia. Russia. Well, Russia, you can't win them all. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? You start with your friends. Have we talked about this to them? Do they put condition? Guess what? The answer is no. So you start thinking about the problem, and you start building solutions. You do not start with the thickest part of the fence and figure out what is the hardest way to have influence. Well, again, that's something we need to be doing. Well, we, we do, and, but problem. I always say problem first, solution second. Not, oh, we don't have any solutions, let's not think about the problem. Yeah. I think People say now JCPOA is a solution where you legitimize uh, enrichment and yeah. eventually reprocessing at one day, yeah. which goes against decade-long U.S. non-proliferation policies. And this is now the argument for the countries in Middle East and elsewhere. Why should we forego when Iran didn't forego? Well, this gets to another point. You know. Uh, there may be some effort to get, quote unquote, a new deal. Now, who knows how well that will go. I see smiling all around this table. <laughs> but how you argue about what you want, or what you argue about you want, may have some impact on how you do things, even with countries that aren't Iran. Let me give you an example. We talked about this last time. Most people don't know it, but the sensors and cameras that the IA has, not all of them actually send a signal in real time or near real time every few minutes back to some remote location like Vienna. Some of them, you got to go every 90 days. Well, within 90 days, you can do an awful lot of mischief, like turn off the lights. So you can't see, pull out a rod, put a dummy in. You will, might not know. You might want to do real-time surveillance. Now, we asked for that surveillance for Natanz. It's an enrichment plant. The IEA, we just learned from the last session from Ali, asked Iran for, for Bushir. And they said, well, no, nah, we don't think so. We don't feel good about that. Well, you might want to double down on that point for any new deal. But you first have to have a problem that would spotlight the desirability of having that kind of solution. That's why the book is interesting. Um, let's, let's yeah, so would it be, how useful of a solution would it be for countries to establish permanent depositories in order to combat like the growing stockpiles of spent fuel and plutonium? Would it be, would it, is that the simplest solution? Recycling in general is a great practice, but this I've been hearing from you that recycling plutonium may not be such a great practice and it would be better just to get rid of it. Would that be one of the simplest and maybe effective solutions? It might be, but given the difficulties of creating repositories, what what's de facto happening, and this would be okay, at least in the short run, is simply long-term storage at the reactors, uh, as long as the fuel isn't reprocessed. I mean, that's basically what's going on in the U.S. And now, you know, now what that'll do for future reactor siting when people realize that not only are you siting a reactor there, but a long-term nuclear, uh, nuclear waste site, 
uh, when you cite the reactor is something else. But on the other hand, they aren't citing many reactors in the U.S. today. So, to what extent does your do the findings that you present in your book bolster the argument of uh, President Trump that we might as well tear up the Iran deal and start over? Uh, well, that's a separate issue, and on my website I've written about the Iran deal. I wasn't a big fan of it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm of two minds. I mean, certainly the Iran deal could be better, and, and given, given what President Trump's done, hopefully he can make it better. Uh, because clearly, be, be clear. So deficient by overlooking reactor grade plutonium. Well, well, there were a number of concessions in the Iran deal that I, I wasn't a big fan of, including the sunset. In fact, Henry and I were among the first people to point out that the, the, the deal as set up in December 2013, we said, hey, well, hey, this is only going to be limited. Now, people didn't focus on that right away because they kept thinking, well, it'll be 30 or 40 or 50 years, it'll be okay. And it was only uh, when, when the actual terms came out, people people realized it. But I would think the U.S., and not just on Iran, though this would strengthen our case with Iran, as a part of a general policy, as I've said, would be no separated plutonium in any non-nuclear weapon state. That way Iran couldn't say, well, hey, you're picking on us. Uh, it, this would apply to any, any such country. And, I, I would, and the same with enrichment, basically the gold, the gold standard. And, you know, and, the, and we could certainly try, given that President Trump wants a new deal, I would, for me, that would be the basis for arranging it. The gold standard, no sunset. But it almost, it seems like you're almost arguing against going ahead with it as it is, because it's well, 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 the U.S. Is, has, I is, think isn't that going ship has sailed, sir. <laughs> okay, so what you're arguing about, you like re-arguing things. It's the decision's been made. Yeah. Can you talk about the difference between uh, can-do reactors and light water reactors and the spent fuel? Since I, my understanding is that if you're having uh, using uranium fuel that's not enriched, it causes um, better opportunities for plutonium production. That's more amount well, um, the U.S. nuclear industry tends to argue that, and certainly I can use can-do reactors. I, I, in the book, uh, again, Chapter 3, uh, discusses the, the plutonium characteristics of can-do versus light water reactors. Uh, certainly in, nor in normal operation, the can-do plutonium is, is somewhat more readily used for weapons. And you know, with its online refueling, I could pr probably get somewhat better material. But this tends to overlook the light water reactors. When they first go into operation, churn out um, significant amounts of low burn-up plutonium the, that's relatively good. Uh, so when I did this thing on, on South Korea yesterday for Henry, I mean, there's already uh, something like two metric tons of rather low burn-up plutonium from light water reactors uh, because they start, they've already started up 21 light water reactors in South Korea, and each one produces some. So you're, you're looking at, at so, so it, it really doesn't matter. What do you, how do you define low burn-up? What, what period of time? Uh, basically uh, one year. Oh. Uh, That's a long time. I mean, you refueled after a year and a half. Well, the Iranians refueled after one year, well, and they and they ten put ten months in the first instance. The first reload you're talking about, right? Yeah. The, the, first, discharge. the first discharge yeah. is, and and the plutonium that comes out of that is pretty good looking. In fact, I've written a paper. I, I reference it in the book. It's on my website because the Iranians published what the plutonium isotopics were of of that fuel from their first. Discharge at Bushir, and it was pretty good. So it's called sporty. Um, if you're really interested, 
and you have hire a physicist. No, no. So I'm happy. Well, no, you don't have to hire a physicist. We did. did you? No, but did you graduate from high school? <laughs> you took chemistry, didn't you? Yeah. You can do this, like Obama said. Yes, you can. Oh. Okay. Make a nuclear weapon. Roughly, <laughs> you can understand it a bit better. There, on our website, there is a primer on fission, fusion, and bomb design. And there's another one on reactors. Now, I'm told we tried to get people who were expert on weapons design to review it, and they pushed it back and said, don't ever ask me to review this. That sounds good. <laughs> Take a look. <laughs> and, well, there you go. Now, it's not perfect. It was written by students using the web. So you can, I'm sure you can get through this. And there are lots of pictures. One of, the, one of my complaints with this presentation here is not enough pictures. We need more pictures. There's one aspect to the candles which you need also to look. And this is the size of the few bundles. It's about this. Yeah. So, you know, when you create a reprocessing scheme, it would be by far more easier to deal with those bundles than with this four meter long. Oh irradiated uh, LWR. So there are yeah. some other aspects well, here. There are advantages yeah. to you. It's also fueled constantly, which means you can adjust how much uh, exposure there is to that uh, neutron uh, process, which means you can actually dictate how much weapons grade versus reactor grade you get out of that fuel by pushing it out a little bit earlier. And it's also harder to inspect because there's all this activity all the time, whereas well, with the light water reactor, you've got to unbolt it. Well, well, but the, but they did. Yes. I mean, it's the thing. It's not. It wasn't a violation of IAEA safeguards when Iran shut down the reactor and took all the fuel out of it in 2012. Yes. And actually, it was taken out by the Russians and not Iranians. Let's speak accurate here. Well, the reactor is still run by the Russians. Yes. By the way, the Americans felt so confident and at ease with the point that you just threw out that we flew approximately 12 to 13 drones over Bushir, make damn sure nothing left the building. You know, so it's not good enough after the fact to know that, oh, well, you know, this was a case or that a case. What you want to do with this kind of nuclear uncertainty is reduce the uncertainty budget as much as you can and not rely on how shall I put it? Thank you. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to. We I have, have an appointment at Dulles this yes. afternoon. And so we're done. <laughs> okay.